Thank you. That concludes general questions. And before we turn to First Minister's questions, members will be aware of reports in the media this morning that the former First Minister, Alex Hammond, has been arrested. As I hope members will also be aware, and as applies with all such matters, that means that the parliamentary rules on subjudice apply as this case is now active. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlaw. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital was the largest new hospital in Europe when it opened. And it's important to say that tens of thousands of Scots have been born and treated there safely and successfully in the years since by some of the world's leading clinicians and an extraordinary number of dedicated staff. However, they and anyone visiting the hospital are entitled to operate within a safe environment and the latest reporting of tragic events this week has shaken confidence. So we welcome the review set up by the Health Secretary. Last year, Professor Alison Britton published her findings into the way in which all future NHS reviews should be conducted, and it made 46 key recommendations. Will the First Minister confirm that the review into the Queen Elizabeth Hospital will meet those tests? First Minister. Uh, yes, we will ensure that the recommendations uh, made by Professor Britton are fully taken account of in uh, the remit and the conduct of the review announced by the Health Secretary earlier this week. The remit uh, and the personnel for that review, I understand, will be announced in coming days. Um, can I thank Jackson Carlaw for the tenor of his question? Uh, the hospital, Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, has treated thousands upon thousands of people safely. Its dedicated staff uh, do an excellent job day in and day out. Uh, but the incidents that have uh, been reported on in recent times are serious and they uh, must be treated seriously. And I hope uh, that not just members across the chamber, but members of the public will take some assurance from the actions that the Health Secretary has taken this week. She visited the hospital this week, was updated on the steps that the Health Board had taken in light of the cryptococcus infection uh, incident, uh, the additional infection control measures that are in place and healthcare environment uh, inspector that has been asked to review that incident. But more generally, given that and other unrelated incidents that have been reported recently, it is considered appropriate that a more general review of the uh, construction, commissioning and maintenance of the hospital is undertaken. And it's right that that is undertaken in a way that is consistent with the recommendations that Jackson Carlow referred to. Jackson Carlow. Can I thank the First Minister for that response and for the insurance she's given in it? I think it is important that having established uh, those recommendations under Professor Britton, that they are surely now followed in the reviews that take place. And I'm also grateful to the First Minister for advising that the review will be both independent and that that review will extend beyond the immediate incident and the incidents that have been reported in the recent past. Beyond that, however, because obviously some of the concerns that are immediate require immediate action, can the First Minister confirm that there are actions being taken now which will address some of the very considerable and serious concerns which have given cause to public uh, anxiety? First Minister. Uh, well, yes, I can give that assurance. And the Health Secretary, when she answered a question in the Chamber on Tuesday, gave some of that information, which I'm happy to go over again uh, for the benefit of uh, the Chamber and uh, those amongst the public who may be uh, listening. In terms of the cryptococcus uh, incident, which of course is the incident uh, that has arisen from bacteria from pigeons, uh, one of the things that the Health Secretary was being updated on by the board uh, on Tuesday was were the additional infection control measures that have been put in place uh, since that incident. Those uh, measures include the provision of prophylactic uh, medication to the relevant group of vulnerable patients and the provision of what are called HEPA filters to ensure clean and, clean, uh, clean and clear air and, of course, uh, additional air monitoring. Uh, these are important steps. Uh, as the Health Secretary uh, said earlier this week, there is no evidence to suggest a general infection control uh, problem at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. The, the statistics do not suggest that is the case, but nevertheless, this is a very serious incident that must be and is being treated seriously. And I should, of course, at the outset, have placed on record my deepest condolences, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of the whole chamber, 
uh, to the families of the two patients uh, who contracted this infection and who have subsequently died. Of course, in one of those cases, tragically that of a child, it was found that this infection was a contributory factor in their death. So I want to assure Jackson Carlow and the Chamber that all appropriate steps will be taken, as I said, separately to the general review that the Health Secretary announced. Uh, she has asked uh, the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate to review this particular incident fully and to recommend any further steps that should be taken. Jackson Carlow. The First Minister for that assurance. Being the largest hospital in Europe, tremendous uh, catchment area of patients depend upon it. Indeed, all of my constituents depend upon the assurance of knowing that that hospital is a safe and secure environment. However, this alarming story has also raised wider questions about the government's record on the NHS, because there is a £900 million maintenance backlog on NHS buildings, including hospitals in Scotland. And nearly half, that's 45, almost 45% of that, is defined by the Scottish Government itself as being high risk. So is it any wonder then that we do see problems emerging, not just at the Queen Elizabeth, but at other hospitals across Scotland? And why is it that in the words of Audit Scotland, the Scottish Government has not planned what investment will be needed? First Minister. Well, in terms of the assurances around the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Jackson Carlow says that all of his constituents rely on the services of that hospital. All of my constituents, the, the hospital used to be in uh, my constituency, so I am very well aware, acutely aware, of the importance of that hospital and of confidence in that hospital to the population across uh, Glasgow and indeed further afield. In terms of maintenance, uh, at any uh, given time, there will be maintenance requirements in the health service estate. Uh, the Scottish Government works closely with health boards through our uh, capital allocations to health boards to make sure that we are providing as far as we can within the resources available to us, uh, capital provision to do that. One of the ways in recent years in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is an example of this that we have uh, chosen to deal with uh, maintenance issues in older hospital buildings, of course, is by reproviding in new purpose built buildings. And the Queen Elizabeth uh, itself brings together in one location hospital services that previously were split across multiple older sites in Glasgow. Uh, Jackson Carlow refers to Audit Scotland. The Scottish Government works to respond to all Audit Scotland recommendations. Obviously, in recent times, uh, the Scottish Government has set out a lot of information around medium-term financial planning uh, and other uh, plans in terms of the medium to long term for the, the health service. Uh, and uh, capital allocations and the estate and making sure the estate uh, is in fit condition will continue to be a key consideration. I'm not going to uh, go into uh, party political exchanges on this issue, it's too serious for that, uh, but obviously we work within uh, a financial envelope and I think everybody knows uh, that that has been uh, under pressure in recent years and everybody knows the reasons for that, but within that uh, we have prioritised spending on the health service and we will continue to do so. Jackson Carlow. The capital budget has increased and it is going to increase further and First Minister is right, there is always a maintenance uh, backlog that has to be addressed. Indeed. When I exchanged uh, with her as health secretary when I spoke in health, it was a £400 million backlog. It's now a £900 million backlog. And a lot of that, according to Audit Scotland, is down to a lack of planning. Because Audit Scotland says there is no long-term plan, no coherent proposals to bring our NHS estate up to the standard so that we can all be assured. Now, the health secretary's review will get to the bottom of what is happening at this flagship hospital and without delay. But isn't it the case that what Scotland really needs is for the record investment which we know is coming to underpin a plan which commands support across this chamber and puts the NHS on a sustainable footing which we can all support for the long term? Will the government commit to do that? First Minister. Well, as, as I assume Jackson Callow knows, but uh, I'll give this information just in case it is not known to him or to the wider chamber. There is a commitment to bring forward a capital investment plan uh, before the end of this financial year. The Health Secretary, I think, has publicly committed to that, uh, and that's a commitment that will be fulfilled, and that will be available to the Chamber for uh, discussion and, and scrutiny in the normal way. That will sit alongside the other plans, including the medium-term financial plan that I've already referred to. Um, these are difficult times in terms of public financing. One of the reasons why we prioritise uh, investment in our health service over, for example, uh, cutting tax for higher paid uh, income earners is because we want to be able to maximise the resources going to frontline health services and we will continue to do that. That doesn't make it easy for those working in the frontline of our health service but in the budget that this uh, chamber will discuss and vote on in the next few weeks 
uh, it is there for all to see the priority we have given to the health service and I can assure the chamber today that we will continue to give it uh, that priority because that's what patients and the public the length and breadth of Scotland expect and deserve. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The awful news that two patients, including a child, died after contracting an infection at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow has shocked us all. Our sympathies, our thoughts are with the families who have lost loved ones. This simply should never have happened. And this morning we see reports of a second infection leaving a patient in a serious condition. The health secretary said yesterday that she believed infection control at the hospital was good enough. Does the First Minister agree? First Minister. Well, the comments of the Health Secretary, which I, I do uh, agree with, uh, were uh, about what I'm going to set out here. Firstly, she was making the point, and, and rightly making the point, that the evidence, the statistics on uh, point prevalence of infection in our hospitals or the statistics around uh, hospital standardised mortality do not suggest that there is a general problem with infection control at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital or across Glasgow uh, more generally. Secondly, she was uh, making the point and seeking to give the assurance to the Chamber uh, that based on her visit on Tuesday, she was satisfied that the additional infection control measures that the hospital had put in place in light of, of this cryptococcus uh, infection incident were uh, sufficient. Uh, those were the, the control measures that I spoke about to Jackson Carlow, the prophylactic med medication uh, and the additional filters. So that was the context of the comments she was making. In no way, shape or form uh, was that intended to suggest that this incident or the unrelated infection incident that Richard, Simpson, uh, Richard Leonard, I beg your pardon, uh, has alluded to is not serious, very serious, and has not been treated seriously. I hope the actions of the Health Secretary uh, this week uh, have underlined how seriously the government is taking this. One of the, the very difficult things, uh, I think, for anybody to come to terms with, and this is something I experienced on uh, several occasions when I was Health Secretary, is that unfortunately and regrettably, on occasion, infections do happen in hospitals and the implications of that for acutely ill patients can be very severe. That's why we work so hard to reduce infection and have the appropriate infection control measures in place. And when things like this happen, it is right that we review that intensely to make sure that any additional steps that are required are taken. And I can give Richard Leonard and the Chamber the assurance that both the Health Secretary and I, and Jean Freeman has kept me extremely updated on this uh, in the course uh, of recent days, that we will continue to ensure that the Health Board is taking all of the steps that people would expect it to take. Richard Leonard. So the answer to my question is that the First Minister does think that infection control at the hospital is good enough. The Health Secretary visited the hospital on Tuesday. So let me ask this, can the First Minister explain why, as of last night, the facilities management workers, including the hospital's cleaners, had still not received a briefing from infection control? First Minister. Uh, well, that is a matter I will uh, look into and ask the Health Secretary to look into, because if that is the case, then clearly they should uh, have done. I would expect uh, those working in this field in any hospital across any part of the health service to be properly briefed uh, in terms of the challenges that are facing. I do, and I, I say this to Richard Leonard in all seriousness, he is mischaracterising both what the Health Secretary and I have just said. Uh, what we were saying uh, what the health secretary said what i have repeated today is that the evidence suggests that there's no general problem with infection control we're not complacent about that and we'll continue to monitor all of the relevant statistics uh, very carefully not just for this hospital but for all hospitals but in particular she was talking about the additional measures that have been put in place in light of this particular infection incident i think she was taken to see uh, some of the measures that had been taken uh, and was satisfied on the basis of the advice given to her that those were the appropriate steps that have been taken but there will be no uh, complacency at all i was uh, health secretary as jackie bailey uh, if she's in the chamber will recall, recall during the c diff uh, outbreak at the vale of leaven hospital I know uh, how devastating these things are for families, I know how devastating they are for staff in hospitals, and I know how damaging they can be to confidence in the health service. Uh, so I personally, Jean uh, Freeman as health secretary and the entire government, will always treat these uh, instances with the utmost seriousness, and I hope that's an assurance that Richard Leonard uh, will take in the good faith in which it's offered. Richard Leonard. Well, the First Minister says that she's not complacent, but this is Scotland's biggest hospital and it's not even four years old. 
Within months of opening, in October 2015, there were reports of elderly patients having to lie in their own excrement because there was no clean linen. Just a few weeks later, in November 2015, a premature baby died after picking up an infection in the neonatal unit. In February 2016, sewage leaks forced the cancellation of operations. In January 2017, an inspection found traces of blood and feces on patient trolleys and mattresses. In March 2018, 22 children became infected as a result of bacteria in the water supply. Last October, 16 children's chemotherapy had to be cancelled because of contaminated drains at the hospital. And this week we learn that there have been further infection outbreaks at the hospital. Now the Cabinet Secretary for Health thinks this is good enough. The First Minister thinks this is good enough. But does the First Minister really expect the public to believe that this is good enough? First Minister. Can I say, in, in all sincerity to Richard Leonard, I think he's better than that last statement he's yeah. made. Sure nobody, he nobody on any side of this chamber, in any part of the political spectrum, thinks, to quote Richard Leonard, it's good enough when there are infection uh, outbreaks in a hospital. Uh, that is why we take these issues so extremely seriously. Generally, and I'm talking generally here, not uh, about these incidents in particular, generally since the Vale of Leave and C. diff outbreak, infection rates in Scotland have fallen dramatically because of the infection control measures uh, and policies that have been put in place. Uh, so these are, are issues that everybody across government and across the health service treats with the utmost uh, seriousness. And uh, while it's absolutely right and proper that we debate these things and that there's a lot of scrutiny on these things, I hope we can all recognise uh, that nobody thinks it is good enough uh, for any patient to get an infection in hospital. Uh, one of the difficult things I said a moment ago, and it is difficult to say this, uh, that infections do happen in hospitals. Uh, there is probably not a hospital anywhere that hasn't had uh, some kind of infection uh, outbreak and the implications for very ill patients can be severe. That is why it is so important that everything possible is done to reduce infection and everything possible uh, in this case will be uh, done to ensure that there is no repetition uh, of this. Now, uh, Richard Leonard uh, cited a range uh, of different instances which are all unrelated and none of them are acceptable. So I'm not saying that they are, but it's because there have been a number of unrelated incidents uh, in this particular hospital that Jean Freeman announced the more general review uh, to look at the, the design, the commissioning and the maintenance of the hospital in order that we can, well firstly, if there are any systemic problems there, they are identified and rectified and if there are not, we can, through the process of that review, give the public the assurance that they deserve. So, you know, I would expect absolutely scrutiny around this to continue, but I really do hope every member across the chamber uh, would recognise and appreciate the seriousness with which not just the government but everybody across the health service is responding to these serious incidents. We have a number of constituency supplementaries. The first from Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, yesterday, West Lothian received uh, yet more devastating news on the jobs front as McRae's, owned by Young's Seafood, uh, announced their plans to shed 50 jobs. Now, while they confirm their ongoing commitment to Livingston and attribute the proposed job losses not to a loss of business, but to an investment in machinery, uh, this will be of absolutely no comfort to 50 families who are now facing an uncertain future and, of course, raises important questions about the role of automation in our economy. So, can the First Minister confirm that Scottish ministers will engage personally and directly uh, with Youngs and others to ensure everything possible is done to support the workforce and to boost the West Lothian economy at this difficult time? First Minister. Well, can I uh, thank Angela Constance for raising this issue, which is of uh, extreme importance in her constituency. And I would absolutely agree with the comment that she made when uh, we face a situation of job losses. The reasons for those job losses are never of any comfort to those who face uh, potentially losing their jobs. And uh, because of that, uh, my uh, thoughts are very much with the McCrae's uh, workforce. This will be a very uh, worrying time uh, for them and for all of uh, Young's employees. Uh, I can give Angela Constance an assurance that the uh, Business uh, and Fair Work Minister spoke to Young's uh, yesterday to discuss the implications 
for the workforce and to ensure that the staff are being properly supported and our multi-agency uh, PACE team uh, stand ready to support the workforce. So as is the case in all situations like this, I can uh, assure Angela Constance that the Scottish Government will do everything uh, possible to try to minimise uh, job losses, but also to support anybody who does uh, face losing their job. Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. A constituent of mine, Margaret Borthwick, has been a patient in the Royal Victoria Hospital for over 18 weeks. The hospital acknowledges that she was well enough to return home in November, but the lack of an appropriate care package has prevented her discharge. Recent figures show that three quarters of delayed discharge were for health and social care reasons. As progress of IGB continues, how can the Scottish Government ensure that the money invested in integration will bring about a consistent level of improvement and will the First Minister intervene on behalf of my constituents so she can go home to be with her family? First Minister. Uh, well, can I firstly deal with the general and then I'll come on to the specific constituency case that Jeremy Balfour uh, raises. First on the general point, reducing delayed discharges is uh, a high priority and progress is being made in that. One of the reasons for integration of health and social care uh, is to make how he health and social care uh, services work more seamless so that people don't fall through the gaps and we're seeing improvements uh, in how uh, delayed discharges are minimised uh, and dealt with. Uh, and we'll continue to invest and support uh, integration authorities to continue that work. In relation to the particular constituency case, obviously I don't know all of the details of that. If uh, the member uh, wishes to, with the consent of his constituent, make those details available to the Health Secretary, uh, I will undertake today that we will look into that, uh, discuss that with uh, the integration authority and see if there is any further action that could be taken to assist in this particular case. And I hope that uh, offer is helpful. Claire Baker to be followed by John Finney. Um, thank you. The First Minister may be aware that Five Gingerbread, an award-winning organisation she has worked closely with, is facing a funding crisis after what they've described as a perfect storm. As a result, more than half the workforce may lose their jobs and 253 of the 350, sorry, 348 vulnerable families they are currently supporting, that's almost two-thirds of their families, may see that vital help end. Can I ask the First Minister if there's any support her government is able to provide to Fife Gingerbread and the families that they help? And will she commit to work with Fife Council and relevant partners to try to find a solution? First Minister. Well, uh, can I say firstly to Claire Baker, she's right to say I know uh, the good work that Fife Gingerbread does. I know how important that work is and I know uh, how many families rely on the services they provide. Um, I don't know all of the details lying behind uh, the situation that Claire Baker has uh, outlined in the chamber today. I will ask the community secretary to engage with uh, Gingerbread and Fife uh, and also with Fife Council to see whether there is any further support the Scottish Government can provide to ensure that they can continue to do the valuable work that they do. And I will ask the community secretary to liaise uh, with Claire Baker uh, once we've had the opportunity to do so. John Finney. Hey, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister is aware of the perilous financial state of Murray Council. Clearly, there's a role for the Scottish Government. Will the First Minister outline what steps will be taken to ensure that my constituents enjoy essential Council services? First Minister. Well, obviously, uh, Murray Council are responsible for the decisions uh, it takes. Uh, with a combination of the, the draft budget resources provided and indeed uh, Murray Council's own potential around council tax, uh, they will have uh, £4.3 million more revenue funding in the coming financial year than the last financial year. Uh, but as I said in another context to Jackson Carlow, these are difficult financial times and I understand uh, the pressures that local councils, including Murray, uh, are operating under. Uh, as I've said many times in the Chamber before, in the draft budget, we have sought to protect local government as far as we can within the resources available to us. Obviously, we are uh, approaching the next stages of consideration of the budget and we remain open. I know there have been discussions uh, with others uh, about uh, whether or not uh, there are areas of the budget where we can uh, redirect money from to uh, further help councils. But as I've said before, and uh, you know, it's simply a statement of fact, we have no unalloc unallocated uh, money. Uh, what we, if we're going to increase money for local authorities, uh, then that money has to come from somewhere else in uh, the budget. And I'm sure these discussions will continue over the next couple of weeks. Question number three, Willie Rennie. I support action that works to change the behaviour of young people who get into trouble. I do not support 13-year-olds being branded as criminals for the rest of their lives for mistakes in their childhood. From everything the government has said, 
the First Minister will next week instruct her MSPs to vote against our amendment to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 14 years old. Is that true? First Minister. Well, this is under uh, consideration. We have, uh, as Willie Rennie knows, uh, we have proposed raising the age of criminal responsibility uh, from 8 to 12. I know there are others across the chamber who think that should go, if there are some across the chamber who think that goes too far, there are others who think it should go further to 14. These are legitimate debates to have and we will continue to listen uh, to the views and the evidence that's uh, brought forward. Uh, there are not just issues in uh, principle uh, between, uh, in the decision between 12 and 14, there are also be practical issues in terms of the uh, sheer volume of cases that would be affected uh, by that. This is something that uh, the Education Secretary is looking carefully at. It's something I and uh, the Cabinet will continue to look uh, carefully at. We think at the moment uh, our balanced judgment is that 12 at this stage is the right uh, age, but of course we remain open to hearing uh, views and opinions from Willie Rennie and from others. Any. That is incredibly disappointing. The First Minister better make up her mind pretty soon because it's before the committee next week. Scotland's Children's Commissioner said this week that Scotland is failing children and falling far behind international standards. Scotland will be behind those bastions of human rights, Russia and China. United Nations and the European Commissioner for Human Rights have pleaded with the Scottish Government to see sense. Just last year, Nicola Sturgeon claimed Scotland would be a world leader on human rights. But the First Minister should know you cannot lead the world from the back of the pack. Will therefore she think again? Will she raise the age of criminal responsibility to 14? or will she stand isolated in the world on human rights? First Minister. Well, actually, I, again, I don't think Willie Rennie does uh, much justice, pardon the pun, to his own arguments here, because it completely uh, misrepresents and, and mischaracterises the overall way in which Scotland uh, deals with young people who commit offences. I, I, uh, I spent Monday afternoon uh, this week visiting a secure unit, uh, Kibble uh, secure unit, uh, seeing for myself how we deal with uh, young people either on welfare grounds who have committed uh, offences and been told by the staff there that in the broader sense Scotland is actually seen as a world leader in how we deal uh, with young people who offend. The, the, age, the, age of criminal, the age of criminal responsibility is important but the overall way in which we deal with young people in the system uh, is what is really important now in terms of uh, the decision about 12 or 14 I mean I'll simply point out that uh, when we consulted on this I think 88 percent of respondents in the consultation were in favor of the age uh, of 12 uh, but we will continue we will continue to listen and as the Lord, I think the Lord Advocate gave evidence uh, to the committee at stage two and uh, what he said then is one of the considerations we require to take account of and it's a practical uh, as well as a principled uh, consideration. Uh, if we are to move to a higher age we have to have confidence that the responses that are available in the children's hearing system are sufficient for any case even the gravest of cases. So this you know this is an important and serious and at times quite sensitive issue and I would simply appeal to uh, those across the chamber who have different views in both directions. Let's all be grown up about how we yeah. deal yeah. with this yeah. and actually yeah. treat the issues with the respect they deserve. Some further supplementaries. The first from Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Maureen Wood. Edinburgh Airport in the region of Lothian is Scotland's busiest and its chief executive at the weekend called for a cut to air departure tax, a policy the SNP previously supported. So will the First Minister end the excuses and confirm the SNP will meet their manifesto commitment and cut ADT in this parliamentary term? First Minister. Well, 
cutting ADT remains our policy, but as the member is aware, we can't do that right now because without going into all of the technical detail of this, uh, the UK government has uh, devolved this not in a fit state because of the state aid issues around the Highlands and Islands exemption. So we continue to try to persuade the UK government to work with us to resolve this. So if Gordon Lindhurst wants us to move uh, more quickly on this, then perhaps he could pick up the phone and speak to his colleagues in the Tory government at Westminster and ask yeah. them to get their finger out <laughs> and help us resolve it. Maureen Watt to be followed by James Kelly. EY's new report this week showed that every single one of the Scottish businesses and trade associations that it consulted has concerns over Brexit. They highlighted risks to competitiveness, profitability and in some cases even their survival. For the sake of Scottish jobs, isn't it high time the Tories ruled out no deal? First Minister. Well, the... The EY study that Maureen Watt refers to was stark, although it shouldn't come as a surprise uh, to anyone. Concerns about the implications of Brexit have been long-standing, but are growing with every day that passes. And, of course, there is a growing concern about the prospect of no deal. And that is a concern that could be removed uh, by the UK government if they decided to take no deal off the table and say that they simply would not allow the UK to leave the EU with no deal. Uh, Mike Russell and I, when we met with uh, the Prime Minister uh, and David Liddington yesterday, again made that case and the Prime Minister refused to do so as she refused to really listen to any of the concerns uh, that have been expressed across Scotland and more widely. So it is time for no deal to be taken off the table. It is time for a request to extend Article 50 and it is time to put this issue back to the electorate so that people can choose not to have Brexit at all so that Scotland and hopefully the whole of the UK can stay within the European Union. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Glasgow Evening Times has reported that one person a month, uh, die, one homeless person a month dies sleeping rough on the city, sleep, the city streets. Uh, last Thursday morning, uh, a young woman living in a tent was found dead in the Gallagate. In addition to that, Glasgow City Council reports that between October 2017 and October 2018, 47 people with open homeless assessments died. This is a shocking situation which should concern the Nicola Sturgeon, not only as First Minister, but as a Glasgow MSP. Can I ask the First Minister what action the government will take in its budget to properly fund homelessness services to put an end to the scandal of people dying on the streets. First Minister. Well, I actually um, agree with James Kelly on this. It is of huge concern to me that anybody in any civilised country would uh, die while sleeping on the streets or, or while homeless. And as long as there is uh, one person in that position, uh, that is not a situation that any of us should tolerate. In terms of action, I, I know James Kelly is aware of the work that we have been doing through the homelessness and rough sleeping uh, task force, which of course has come up with a number of recommendations uh, that are about tackling uh, homelessness and rough sleeping. We've also established and referenced his question about budgetary uh, steps. We've established the 50 million tackling homelessness fund, which is about uh, tackling this problem in a very targeted and direct way. And we've had you know, some of the best experts in this field helping us bring forward these recommendations. So there is a real determination, I know on the part of Glasgow City Council and local authorities across the country, backed by the third sector and certainly backed by the Scottish Government to get to a point where we eradicate homelessness and we eradicate rough sleeping because it has no place in any civilised society and I certainly as First Minister it will not rest on this issue until we get to that point and I hope we have the support of people right across the chamber. Question number four, Tom Arthur. Minister, how the Scottish Government is marking Holocaust Memorial Day. First Minister. Well, we must never forget the horrors of the Holocaust and other genocides around the world, which are a stark reminder of the inhumanity and violence that bigotry and intolerance can cause if left unchallenged. Uh, last year, as I've noted in the chamber before, I joined young people from 89 Scottish schools on a Holocaust Educational Trust's visit to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, I know I will never forget what I saw there, and I'm sure the young people who were with me won't either. Uh, we mustn't ever forget where uh, anti-Semitism uh, 
and uh, what anti-Semitism can lead to uh, if it's not challenged and why education about tolerance, compassion and respect is so important. Next week, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities will be speaking at this year's national event to mark International Holocaust Memorial Day, which will take place in East Renfrewshire. There will also be a members debate in Parliament, I know, later today. And I also had the honour of signing the Holocaust Memorial Day Book of Commitment in Parliament earlier this week. Tom Arthur. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Two of the most important lessons of the Holocaust are of the capacity of human beings to systematically inflict suffering and death on other human beings, and that such actions can take place in what had been regarded as an advanced society. A third, as the First Minister referenced in her answer, is the consequences of hate and discrimination left unchallenged. President Officer, what began with casual anti-Semitism laced with conspiracy theories and pseudoscience traversed a darkening spectrum of increasing social and economic marginalisation, which led ultimately to the factories of death at Helmo, Maginek, Treblinka, Berzhek, Sobibor, and Auschwitz-Birkenau. As the Holocaust slowly passes from living memory, can the First Minister advise the Chamber on how the Scottish Government will continue to support work to ensure that the memory of the Holocaust is preserved for future generations and that they are taught those lessons which we must never forget? First Minister. Can I thank Tom Arthur, firstly, for uh, reminding us so eloquently and powerfully of the horrors of the Holocaust and other genocides, but also reminding us, particularly in the world we live in today, of the importance of no one uh, being a bystander in the face of intolerance and hate. Uh, when you stand uh, in Birkenau at the end of the railway line, as many others in this chamber I know will have done, uh, you realise very powerfully that the Holocaust did not start there, it ended there, and it got to that stage because hatred, anti-Semitism, intolerance uh, was tolerated uh, by many, many people. We mustn't be bystanders, and that's the most important message uh, as we mark uh, this year's Holocaust Memorial Day. Uh, in terms of future generations, it's vital uh, as the Holocaust passes out of living memory that the next generations remember and learn the lessons. Uh, learning about the Holocaust is part of international and citizenship education, which of course are central to curriculum for excellence. In addition, the Scottish Government supports the Holocaust Educational Trust Lessons from Auschwitz programme. That programme includes a visit to Auschwitz Birkenau and aims to increase knowledge and understanding of the Holocaust. And I've made uh, a very public commitment to the Holocaust Educational Trust that as long as I uh, am First Minister, we will continue that support. And I'm sure across all parties there would be the commitment to uh, continue it long, long uh, into the future. Uh, participating students in that, of course, also become Holocaust ambassadors within their own schools and communities, and they do excellent work to keep remembrance alive. And it's important, I think, that all of us in our roles as constituency uh, and regional MSPs support those uh, fantastic young ambassadors uh, as the, the ones who not just keep the memory of the Holocaust alive, but also help to pass that message about uh, not being tolerant of hatred uh, to the next generation and beyond. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that partner providers are part of a sustainable solution for the rollout of 1140 hours of funded childcare. First Minister. It's very, very clear that we value highly the role of private providers in delivering high quality, flexible early learning and childcare to families across Scotland. Uh, the funding follows the child model, empowers parents to access uh, their child's uh, 1140 hours entitlement from any high quality setting in the public, private or third sectors, uh, which meets our new provider neutral national standard. Uh, we've established a partnership forum to ensure providers' voices are heard and responded to. Uh, and we've also set out a range of actions to help providers transition to 2020 in our delivery support plan, which was published in December. Uh, the funding deal that we reached with COSLA to deliver the expansion secures sustainable and significantly increased funding rates for all providers. And that is exactly what providers called for in a recent member survey from the National Day Nurseries Association. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that answer and, and can I assure her that we on these benches fully support the principle of increasing supporting child care and recognise, as the First Minister has stated, the crucial role that partner providers must play if the policy is going to be successful. 
However, I want to bring to the attention of the First Minister and to the Scottish Government that the investment they have provided for this policy in many cases is not creating the collaborative working between many councils and partner providers. Repeatedly, it has been brought to my attention and that of my colleagues that partner providers are being frozen out of the process and are being valued at a rate far less than that of council-run facilities. The result is that they and after-school care providers are losing key staff to council-run facilities at an alarming rate and, in short, the remuneration they are receiving for the excellent service they continue to provide does not allow them to compete with salaries being paid in the public sector. With this in mind, can the First Minister uh, further commit her government to ensure that as part of the 1140 hours childcare rollout, partner providers across all councils are fairly treated? Because if we lose them, uh, First Minister, this important policy will fail. First Minister. Well, again, I, I don't disagree with uh, the substance of that question. I am very aware that there are concerns on the part of private providers about the rollout of this policy uh, and potential implications for them. That is why we are working very hard through some of the arrangements that I spoke about in my initial answer to make sure there is uh, the proper collaboration between local authorities uh, and providers uh, in the private and indeed third sectors because this policy will only uh, be delivered uh, with a contribution uh, across uh, the different sectors and we will continue. Marie Todd of course is leading this work for the government and is working really hard to ensure that those concerns are understood, recognised and responded to. In terms of funding, the funding agreement with COSLA which of course took a lot of time and negotiation to reach uh, and it involved the government giving more money than had uh, originally uh, been considered. Uh, that funding agreement includes funding for the payment of sustainable rates to providers from 2020 and hourly rates uh, across the country will significantly increase over the period to 2020. Uh, the funding package is underpinned by a shared commitment to pay sustainable rates uh, to providers in the private and third sectors which reflect the cost of delivery uh, and that uh, is an important part of ensuring uh, and assuring uh, providers in the private sector that they will remain competitive when it comes to attracting staff. So we recognise those concerns uh, and I hope uh, the member will be assured that there is a considerable amount of work being done uh, both to recognise and to respond to these concerns in the appropriate way. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many private providers in nursery education regrettably cannot match the staffing costs of local authorities. And if a partner provider pays the living wage, this could increase the cost of childcare over and above the 11.40 free hours, especially for children below the age threshold for a funded placement. What specific steps can the Scottish Government take to prevent childcare costs rising in private nurseries as a result of providers paying the living wage? First well, of course, the funding settlement that we reached with COSLA has as part of it the commitment to pay the living wage to staff in any uh, sector that are providing the 1140 hours. And I think that is an important commitment and one that is uh, supported by people across the chamber. Uh, that will involve an increase in the hourly rates paid to private providers. These are uh, inevitably discussions between individual local authorities and providers in their own areas. But the funding settlement envisages that increase uh, in hourly rates in order that uh, private providers or third sector providers are able to pay the living wage, uh, ha are being paid at a sustainable level so that they can attract the staff and deliver the quality service that we're asking them to do. Let me just reiterate this point because I think it's an important, it's in everybody's interest to take private providers with us on this journey because the policy will not be delivered without their valuable contribution. So uh, we recognise the anxieties and concerns that they have and we will continue to work with them uh, to address and respond to those concerns in a systematic and patient way. And I, I hope the Chamber uh, takes some assurance uh, from that commitment. Question number six, Pauline McNeill. To ask the First Minister what assistance the Scottish Government is giving EU nationals to apply to the EU settlement scheme. First Minister. Well, I'm pleased that the Prime Minister has uh, belatedly seen sense and accepted our argument that the uh, settled status fee, the unfair settled status fee, should be scrapped. Uh, we are very clear we want EU citizens to stay in Scotland 
Uh, while there is still a requirement to apply for settled status, and I don't think there should uh, be a requirement for people who already have their home in Scotland to apply for the right to stay here. I think that is grotesque. Uh, but while there is that uh, requirement, the Scottish Government's uh, advice service, which uh, will be delivered in partnership with Citizens Advice Scotland, will help ensure that EU citizens feel welcome, supported and valued. In addition to this, we've funded the EU Citizens' Rights Project to deliver outreach and awareness raising events with EU citizens across the country. Uh, of course, dropping the fee, as I said a moment ago, doesn't change the fact that the UK government is making EU citizens apply to retain their current rights. Uh, and I think the Prime Minister's approach to this and to migration more generally makes it all the more clear why it's time for this parliament to have powers over immigration. Polly McNeill. I can see that the First Minister does agree with me that the approach of the UK government to European citizens who have made their home in Scotland and the UK is a slap in the face to their commitment to the United Kingdom and many who have lived here in Scotland longer than their country of birth. And what this UK government don't seem to recognise is the rejection that those EU citizens feel. Jill Rutter, think tank, director of Britain's Future, says that the Home Office must invest in getting the EU settlement scheme right from the start. A failure to do so, she said, could cause massive problems in years to come on a far bigger scale than the wind rush scandal. In view of this, can the First Minister just reassure me and the Parliament that everything will be done within the powers of her at her disposal to ensure that those who are harder to reach, because many will not be documented when this scheme is finished, especially those who have language barriers and the elderly, all that can be done to ensure that they are uh, able to stay here. First Minister. Uh, yes, I can give that assurance. From the day after uh, the Brexit referendum, I have been at pains to say to EU citizens that they are welcome here, this is their home, and we want them to stay. And as far as we can, within our limited powers in this area, we will back that rhetoric up with the kind of action that I've spoken about. I regret deeply that people who have built their homes here, who consider this to be their home as much as I do or any of us in this chamber do, are being made to apply for the right to stay here. I think that is awful and I can't begin to imagine how that makes uh, an EU national feel. Um, there's also the practical point, a point that Mike Russell and I were making again to the Prime Minister yesterday and unfortunately with no uh, appearance of her really listening to this. In Scotland, we need people to want to come and live here and work here and stay study here. We need to grow our working age population. So as well as what the UK government is doing being wrong in principle, it's practically damaging for Scotland. And that's why, as I say, the sooner we get these matters into our own hands, able to take decisions here in Scotland, rather than have these decisions taken in Westminster, the better for all of us. Thank you, and that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Richard Lyle on remembering the Holocaust. But before we do, we'll just suspend uh, very briefly, brief suspension to allow the gallery to clear as well as members and ministers to change seats. A brief suspension.